أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. We were discussing the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. We had mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu uh, alaihi he saw a dream wherein he was performing pilgrimage. He was performing the pilgrimage with his companions and when he woke up from his dream of course the dream of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa is a type of divine inspiration the prophet mobilized uh, somewhere between 1400 to 1600 of his companions he invited them to perform the pilgrimage uh, with him of course as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa is making his way to mecca News spreads that the Prophet ﷺ is planning on entering Mecca. Quraysh, of course, is suspicious. They are questioning the Prophet's uh, real motives. The Prophet ﷺ sends emissaries to them. They send emissaries to him to clarify what he is intending on doing. The Prophet ﷺ made it very clear to them that his only intention was to perform the pilgrimage, he wanted to venerate and sanctify the house of God. Now after a very long standoff between Quraysh and the Prophet, Quraysh, they decide to send Suhail ibn Amr to go and negotiate a peace treaty. They realize that no fighting will ensue but they also recognize that we have to come to some sort of agreement with Muhammad. Ibn Hisham, he reports the following. He says, He says, فَأَتَاهُ سُهَيْلُ بْنُ عَمْرُ فَلَمَّا رَآهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ مُقْبِلًا قَالْ قَدْ أَرَادَ الْقَوْمُ الصُّلْحَ حِينَ بَعَثُوا هَذَا الرَّجُلِ When Suhail ibn Amr was approaching the Prophet, when they dispatched him to meet the Prophet, as soon as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa saw that Suhail was the one who was chosen to initiate the negotiations, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he says, Quraysh wants a treaty since they have sent this man. And the reason why the Prophet ﷺ, he says this is because Suhail is not just an ordinary person. Suhail ibn Amr is one of the senior figures of Quraysh. This is a man who has a record of being a savvy politician. This is an individual who is recognized for his diplomacy and his negotiation tactics. So when the Prophet sees Suhail, immediately immediately the Prophet knows, okay, Quraysh means business, they're serious about coming to an agreement. Now among Quraysh, Suhail ibn Amr was such a powerful speaker, he was such a persuasive speaker, that he carried the title of Khatib Quraysh, the orator of Quraysh. And you can imagine you know, what sort of accolade this was, especially considering that Quraysh were a people who placed great importance on a person's ability to articulate. These are people of eloquence, these are people of poetry, these are people of literature. So for them to grant such a title to Suhail really speaks to you know what a powerful order he was you know he was one of the most persuasive of men a master debater and hence he was the one who was chosen to go and meet the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa so as soon as the prophet sees him uh, 
he he recognizes and it becomes abundantly clear that Quraysh uh, they definitely want uh, a peace treaty or a truce of some sort. Now, Suhail's family background is quite interesting, and it it will be relevant to the the negotiations that will uh, that we'll speak about. So Suhail, of course, is a pagan at this point. Of course, later on, after the conquest of Mecca, he converts. However, in Hudaybiyah, he's representing the Mushrikeen. Now, incidentally, Suhail, he had two sons, both of whom converted to Islam. So he was kind of in an awkward position. So his first son... Abdullah ibn Suhail, he secretly converted to Islam. In fact, if you look at his story, uh, historians mention that he, no one knew that he had converted to Islam when he was in Mecca. And he actually joined the army of the Mushrikeen as they were marching towards Badr. So he was with them, and of course it was assumed that he was on the side of the Mushrikeen. But as soon as they arrived and they set camp at Badr, the historical accounts tell us that he managed to quietly slip away. He slipped away, he snuck away from the, the camp of the Mushrikeen, and he joined the camp of the Muslims. So this is essentially how he was able to make it to Medina. He was always you know, trying to figure out a way to escape. And there was no, uh, he had no opportunity to join uh, his brothers and sisters in Islam in Medina. So the Battle of Badr was a golden opportunity for him to depart Mecca without drawing any eyes on himself. And then he switches sides uh, shortly before the Battle of Badr. So this is Abdullah ibn Suhail. Suhail ibn Amr also had another son, a younger son, by the name of Abu Jandal ibn Suhail. This is the younger brother. Now, after his older brother had converted to Islam, he also wanted to join Islam. And he wanted to emigrate to Medina. He wanted to live among Muslims. However, he was not very good at hiding his faith. You know, unlike his brother who was very secretive and he did not raise any suspicions from his father, Abu Jandal, uh, was, uh, it was discovered that he was a Muslim and his father ends up imprisoning him. He puts him in a dungeon, he chains him up, he puts him in cuffs and shackles and chains. And what is truly astonishing is that you know, even though this is his own son, Suhail ibn Amr keeps his own son imprisoned in a dungeon from the time of the Battle of Badr, which is the second year after the Hijrah, up until Hudaybiyah. So for, for nearly four years, Abu Jandal ibn Suhail ibn Amr is essentially imprisoned by his own father. So Suhail ibn Amr has a vested interest in coming to some sort of agreement that would prevent uh, renegades, prevent young people especially, from converting to Islam and escaping. So he wants to cut off the, uh, the, the trickling out of people from Mecca and the strengthening of Islam through the numbers of people who are leaving Mecca. So, Suhail arrives, he meets with the Prophet. Now among the preliminary demands, you know, before the official negotiations uh, begin, there's an understanding that, okay, if we want to, if we're serious about negotiating, we have to free uh, the captives that are being held on both sides. The Muslims had uh, certain captives and Quraysh had held captives. If you, if you recall, you know, Uthman ibn Affan and some of the other Muhajireen, uh, when the Prophet arrived and he set camp in uh, the valley of Hudaybiyah, some of the Muhajireen, they decided to informally enter 
Mecca to meet with their family. Many of them were detained. They were held as captives. They were not permitted to return to the camp of the Muslims in Hudaybiyah. So, both sides agree to release the captives. The Muslims release the captives that they were holding. Quraysh, they release the captives who were detained in Mecca. And in addition to that, Quraysh insisted that the Muslims not enter Mecca this year. And they wanted them to delay their pil pilgrimage to the following year, following year. And at that time, there was an agreement that the next year, next year, the Prophet and the Muslims can come, they can perform their pilgrimage, and the pagans will evacuate. They will basically leave the city and allow the Muslims to perform the, the rituals of the pilgrimage without any interference from the pagans. Now, the reason why, one of the main reasons why the Mushrikeen, the Quraysh of Mecca, were adamant about not allowing the Prophet to enter Mecca was because they wanted to send a clear message that they were not weak. If they were to allow the Prophet ﷺ to enter Mecca, this would create a perception in the minds of the neighboring tribes that Quraysh is weak, Quraysh, you know, Muhammad is the arch enemy of Quraysh. And he's able to freely enter and no one has the power to stop him. So letting them, letting the Muslims enter this year would send the message that the Prophet had forced their hand. That they were weak and the Prophet ﷺ had the upper hand. Quraysh, you know, the Meccans are very proud people. They have a lot of pride. They did not want to be perceived as vulnerable. So delaying the pilgrimage, delaying it until next year showed that the Quraysh were still in control of Mecca. The Quraysh were in control of the situation, even though they were weak. But image matters, perception matters. And therefore, they knew that if they gave that up, then they would be inviting uh, you know, invaders potentially. Uh, Mecca itself would be vulnerable to attack. Now, the Muslims, the companions of the Prophet, they were surprised that the Prophet ﷺ was willing to negotiate, that he was willing to enter into such a treaty. Because remember, ever since the Hijrah, you know, the Muslims had established their own state. They were, they had become, you know, victory after victory had uh, established that they were an independent political force to be reckoned with. So many of the Muslims did not understand why the Prophet ﷺ uh, was interested in negotiating a treaty. You know, the, the companions are thinking that, okay, we defeated the pagans in Badr. Uh, the Quraysh really did not defeat us in Uhud, even though we didn't defeat them. But the Battle of Uhud was not necessarily a loss for us. And then you have the, the victory, you know, the crushing uh, defeat of the Quraysh and the Ahzab in the Battle of Khandaq. And the Muslims were essentially, they saw themselves in a position of power. They felt that they had the upper hand. They were used to military conflict with the pagans. So this actually, the fact that the Prophet was willing to compromise led many people to doubt in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ibn Hisham, in his seerah, he reports, فَلَمَّ الْتَأَمَّ الْأَمْرُ وَلَمْ يَبْقَ إِلَّا الْكِتَابِ You know, after the, the terms of the treaty were agreed upon, at least verbally, but they had not yet been written. So after the Prophet comes to this verbal agreement with Suhail ibn Amr, and we'll speak, we'll speak about what exactly were the terms of the, the treaty. So after everything was verbalized, but before it was actually ratified into a written contract, وَثَبَ Umar ibn al-Khattab Umar jumped up. Umar was livid. He was outraged. 
ثم أتى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله فقال يا رسول الله ألست برسول الله عمر بن الخطاب he goes to the prophet in a fit of anger and he says O messenger of Allah are you not the messenger of God and this is where the prophet صلى الله عليه وآله he says بلا yes I am the messenger of Allah so Umar asks أَوَلَسْنَا بِالْمُسْلِمِينَ Are we not Muslims? قَالَ بَلَى The Prophet says, yes, we're Muslims. Umar then asks, أَوَلَيْسُوا بِالْمُشْرِكِينَ Are they not pagans? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, yes, they're pagans. Then he says, فَعَلَى مَا نُعْطِي الدَّنِيَ فِي دِينِنَا so Umar then, he asks, then why should we take this disgrace for our religion? Now, mind you, the Prophet is negotiating this. He sees the Prophet as putting the Muslims in a state of disgrace. Why should we accept this sort of disgrace for our religion? And this is where the Prophet ﷺ, he says to Umar, أنا عبد الله. I am the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ana Abdullahi wa Rasuluh. I am the servant of God and I'm his messenger. Lan ukhalif amrahu walan yudayya walan yudayya'ani. I will never go against the command of God and he will never forsake me. So here the Prophet is reminding Umar that, you know, don't think that I do things of my own accord. I'm doing this in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in compliance with the divine will. So Umar was one of the most vocal in opposing the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, going so far to even question the very prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now, someone may say that, oh, you know, he, he, that was just said out of anger and it was about, about his ghira for Islam. My dear brothers and sisters, when someone speaks to the Messenger of Allah, they have to observe the highest level of adab. You know, at the end of the day, who knows better? Who knows better than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In fact, we have a narration that Al-Waqidi reports that there was a conversation that took place many years later, you know, perhaps maybe even during the Khilaf of Umar. Many years later, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and Umar ibn al-Khattab, they have the following conversation. Al-Waqidi reports, Qala Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, Jalastu inda Umar ibn al-Khattab yawman, fadhakara al qadiyya Abu Sa'id, he says, I was sitting with Umar ibn al-Khattab one day and he recalled, he was recalling what happened at Hudaybiyyah. فَقَالْ لَقَدْ دَخَلَنِي لَقَدْ دَخَلَنِي يَوْمَئِذٍ مِّنَ الشَّكِّ وَرَاجَعْتُ النَّبِيِّ يَوْمَئِذٍ مُرَاجَعَةً مَا رَجَعْتُ مِثْلَهَا قَطْ Umar ibn al-Khattab essentially says that on the day of Hudaybiyyah, I had serious doubts about the Prophet. I doubted him in a way that I had never doubted him. I doubted his authority, I doubted his nubuwa. So this is something that Umar ibn al-Khattab himself admits. And this is highly problematic. You know, for a Muslim to doubt that Rasulullah is indeed a messenger of Allah simply because he does something that I'm not able to understand, because he does, he calls for something where I am not able to see the wisdom. So Umar then, in that same narration, Umar mentions that he spends years trying to atone for the doubt that he had on that day. So, Umar himself, he says that, you know, I doubted the nubuwa of Rasulullah and 
up until that day, ever since that day, I've been trying to atone for uh, for what I did on that day. And then Umar says, according to the narration, ثُمَّ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ عَاقِبَةَ الْقَضِيَّةِ خَيْرًا And he says, then after a while, I realized that what the Prophet did was the best. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it all turn out well. He thought that the treaty was a devastating failure. It was a loss. From Umar's perspective, Hudaybiyah was detrimental to the future of Islam. He did not trust the Prophet's judgment. He questioned the Prophet's prophethood. And he himself says, I spent years trying to atone for that. But then he says, after the passing of the days and the months and the years, I realized that indeed the Messenger of Allah was right. And then he says, فَيَنْبَغِي لِلْعِبَادِ أَنْ يَتَّهِمُ الرَّأِي He says that what I learned from that incident is that people should be, skept- should be skeptical of their own opinions. And this is, you know, an interesting statement, especially because when you look at the seerah of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he, he wasn't, he didn't, it didn't seem that he was skeptical of his own opinions. Because there are things that he banned that the Prophet had made permissible. So his words, unfortunately, do not align with his actions. You know, Umar ibn al-Khattab is known for making certain decisions that clearly go against the prophetic sunnah. In any case, he says people should be skeptical of their own opinions. And he says, وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ دَخَلَنِي يَوْمَئِذٍ مِنَ الشَّكْ حَتَّى, حتى قُلْتُ فِي نَفْسِي لَوْ كُنَّا مئة رجل على مثل رأي ما دخلنا فيه أبدا. He says, I swear by God that my doubt on the day of Hudaybiyah was such that if there were a hundred people who shared my opinion, so mind you, there were about 1400 to 1600 companions. Umar says, if I had a hundred supporters, right? if I had less than 10%, if I had 5% of the support, I would have never allowed uh, that treaty to take place. So Umar ibn al-Khattab, what is he saying here? He's saying that I was so confident in my opinion, even though it was the opposite of the Prophet's view, that if I had 5% support from the Sahaba of the Prophet, I would have used those numbers to override the opinion of the Prophet. And of course, this is an important moment of reflection here. If Umar ibn al-Khattab is saying that if I had a hundred people, I would have, I would have, essentially, attempted to override what the Prophet wanted to move forward with. Why is it surprising that after the death of the Prophet, Umar ibn al-Khattab also wanted to override what the Prophet had declared on the day of Ghadir? So this is someone who's clearly saying that I had doubts about the nubuwa of the Prophet. If I had 5% support from the Sahaba, I would, have, I would have not allowed that to move forward. So this is someone who's very headstrong about what he believes. He just didn't have the numbers, he didn't have the support. In any case, meaning if people were, were to verbalize that they were on his side, he would have taken certain actions and he would have completely derailed the treaty of Hudaybiyah. Umar continues, according to Al-Waqidi, وَقَدْ كَانَ أَصْحَابُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ يَكْرَهُونَ الصُّلْحِ The companions of the Prophet, they hated the treaty. Why? لِأَنَّهُمْ خَرَجُوا لَا يَشُكُّونَ فِي الْفَتْحِ لِرُؤْيَا رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله أنه حلق رأسه they hated the treaty. The Sahaba of the Prophet, they hated the treaty of Hudaybiyah. Why? Because they set out without any doubt that they would enter Mecca because of the Prophet's dream. And now many of them are thinking to themselves that the Prophet was wrong. He had a dream. He told us that we're going to perform the pilgrimage. What is happening now? The dream of the Prophet, the vision of the Prophet is not being actualized. So, 
This creates a lot of doubt in the minds of the Sahaba and Umar ibn al-Khattab was among the few who vocalized that doubt. Now in terms of the writing of the treaty, so there was a lot of commotion after just the verbal uh, con the verbal discussions on the uh, surrounding the conditions of the treaty. Ibn Hisham, he mentions that after the conditions were agreed upon, now the Prophet ﷺ wants to ratify the treaty. He wants to put it in writing. And this is an important lesson for us, brothers and sisters. That it's important for us, especially when it comes to matters of this importance, of this level of importance, we should put things in writing. You take out a loan, you, have, you, give, you issue someone a loan, put it in writing, just so expectations are clear. Right? So when it comes to this treaty, the Prophet insists that it's put in writing. Both parties insist that it's put in writing. ثُمَّ دَعَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلِي إِبْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ رَضْوَانُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet, he summons Ali ibn Abi Talib to be the scribe, to write the the contract to write the treaty فَقَالُ اكْتُبْ The Prophet says to Ali, write down the following Write بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The Prophet, he had this habit of commencing anything major or minor, insignificant or trivial everything he would do, he would begin it with the blessed name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Basmala بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so the Prophet is dictating this to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Suhail, he stops him. Suhail says to the Prophet, لا أعرف هذا That this Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, this phrase is foreign to me. I don't know of a God who is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is foreign to me. ولكن اكتب Suhail says instead, write بسمك اللهم Write in your name, O God. This is how we this is how we invoke the name of God. This was how the pagans would begin their, their writings and their poetry and so on. فَكَتَبَهَا The Prophet ﷺ, he consents. He makes this concession. And this is a very important lesson for us, brothers and sisters. Sometimes we have to know when to make concessions. Is there anyone who has greater authority than the Prophet? And you see the Prophet ﷺ, sometimes he sees the wisdom in making some concessions to achieve a greater good. That we shouldn't be stubborn. You know, sometimes when people become fanatical, they lose their ability to make some compromises. Now, I'm not saying that we compromise our value, but there are some things that do not violate Islamic values. There are some things that we have to be willing to compromise for the sake of a peaceful coexistence. So the Prophet, he consents to his request. And he, he continues dictating. So you see that even though the Prophet is granting these concessions, he still puts himself in a position of authority. He still asserts his strength. He's telling Ali ibn Abi Talib, write down, هَذَا مَا صَالَحَ عَلَيْهِ Muhammad Muhammadun Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله Suhail ibn Amr. He tells Ali, write down, this is what Muhammad, the Messenger of God, has agreed with Suhail ibn Amr. فَقَالَ Suhail, لَوْ شَهِدْتُ أَنَّكَ رَسُولُ أَنَّكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ لَمْ أُقَاتِلَكَ لَمْ أُقَاتِلَكَ Suhail argues that if we knew you to be the Messenger of God, we would not have barred you from the house. We would not have fought against you. Instead of writing Rasulullah, اكتب هذا ما صالح عليه محمد بن عبد الله صلى الله عليه وآله سهيل بن عمر. So he says instead, just write Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, because this is how we knew you back in Mecca. Now again, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله he yields. He yields to Suhail's objection. The Prophet ﷺ, he asks Ali ibn Abi Talib to cross out the title Rasulullah after his name. 
Ali ibn Abi Talib, being the man that he is, being the one who would give anything in the service of the Messenger of Allah, who was willing to give his life for the Prophet. There is no one who knows the maqam of Rasulullah like Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali cannot bring himself to cross out the title Rasulullah. How could Ali ibn Abi Talib cross the name out? So the Prophet sees that this is too heavy for Ali. Rasulullah, he strikes out the words himself. And he replaces it with Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Now a question here that arises is that did Ali ibn Abi Talib disobey the Prophet? The Prophet said, cross my name out. Ali ibn Abi Talib couldn't bring himself to do so. Now, of course, our ulama, they make a distinction between a command that is binding and a, a request that is not binding. So the scholars, they describe this action, the action of Ali ibn Abi Talib, as not doing what the Prophet asked out of adab, not out of insubordination. You know, sometimes someone disobeys the Prophet because they, they're being, they're, they're being uh, insubordinate, they're being defiant, they're being arrogant, they're being careless, they're being reckless. Ali ibn Abi Talib refusing to cross out the name of the name, the title Rasulullah is not because he was trying to defy the Messenger of God. On the contrary, his adab, his reverence for the Prophet did not allow him to cross out the name of Rasulullah. So the Prophet asking Ali to cross out his name was not a binding command such that not complying with it would constitute a legal sin. Far from that is Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib would give anything for Rasulullah. This is similar to when a teacher says to a student, you know, come and take my seat and I'll sit on the, on the floor. The student will not listen. The student would not allow the teacher to sit on the floor while he sits in a chair. So we don't sit, we would never say that, oh, the, the, the student is disobeying the teacher. No, the student is, is not willing to do that. The student finds it difficult to do that because of his great respect for the teacher. This is exactly what is happening between Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi alayhima. So, the agreement that they come to, the narration says, اصطلحَ عَلَى وَضْعِ الْحَرْبِ عَنِ النَّاسِ عَشْرِ سِنِينَ One of the first things what they agree to is, one of the first things that they agree to, is that they agree to remove war from the people for 10 years. And this is something that's significant. And inshallah, in our uh, subsequent episodes, we will speak about what made Hudaybiyah such a great victory for the Prophet and for Islam. Now remember, my dear brothers and sisters, we are in the sixth year after the Hijrah. Ever since the Prophet arrived in Medina, ever since he escaped the assassination plot in Mecca, the Muslims have known nothing but war and bloodshed. They've been antagonized. They've been pursued and harassed by the Quraysh. They haven't had a single moment to breathe. Constantly on guard. Constantly concerned about their safety and their security. So this is a, this is a major uh, uh, condition, a very important condition. They agreed to remove war from the people for 10, 10 years of peace. During this time, the people are to be in security. And no one is to lay hands on one another. And then the, the next part of the, con, of the treaty is whoever of Quraysh comes to Muhammad without permission of his guardian, Muhammad is to send them back. Now here, Suhail ibn Amr, he has a vested interest in this condition. He already lost one of his sons, 
who had escaped. Suhail now has one more son left, Abu Jandal. He doesn't want his second son to escape to Mecca, to, to escape to Medina. So Suhail basically says that this condition, first and foremost, it applies to my younger son. That if he tries to flee Mecca and join you, you are contractually obligated to send him back to Mecca. So Suhail is very passionate about these conditions. So whoever of Quraysh comes to Muhammad without permission of his guardian, Muhammad is to send them back. And whoever of those with Muhammad who comes to Quraysh will not be sent back. If a Muslim enters Mecca, they are not, they're, they're not going to be sent back to Medina. But if someone from Medina enters Mecca, if a Muslim from Medina enters Mecca, he will be detained. He will not be sent back. Now, this, of course, the Quraysh think that this is an advantage for them. But in reality, this is an advantage for Islam. Because the Prophet wants there to be a Muslim presence in Mecca. If a Muslim leaves Medina, enters Mecca, keep him there. The Prophet says, yes, keep him there. The Prophet ﷺ wants Islam to spread in Mecca. He has hopes that those people who end up being detained and not permitted to travel out of Mecca, the Prophet has hopes that maybe through interactions with other pagans, they will soften their hearts to Islam. This is the genius of Rasulullah. So, Suhail, he continues saying that between us, evil is to be abstained from, and there is to be no raiding, that we cannot you know, disrupt each other's caravans. There's peace now between us. Whoever wants to enter into a covenant and alliance with Muhammad is to do so. And whoever wants to enter into a covenant and alliance with Quraysh is to do so. So here you see Quraysh has finally begun to speak to the Prophet and to the Muslims as an independent political power. Now, Islam, Islam is on the map now. Islam, has, Islam is now on the world stage. Islam is a political force. Because you don't enter into peace treaties with a renegade state. You enter into peace treaties with with an established economic power. So this was a new chapter for the Muslims. They are now seen by their worst enemies as an independent political entity. So the Muslims are allowed to enter into treaties with whomever they wish. And Quraysh is free to enter and uh, initiate treaties with whoever they wish. And then... The, the treaty states, you are to withdraw from us this year and not enter Mecca against us. And when next year comes, we shall go out in front of you and you shall enter it. You shall enter Mecca with your companions and remain in it for three days. We will exit Mecca, we will evacuate Mecca and Muhammad and his companions, they can perform the pilgrimage in peace. You have three days. But you shall not have the and you shall you shall have the arms of the rider, meaning that you don't come armed. You only carry the the arms of a regular traveler. You don't come with swords and spears and shields. Your swords are to be in their sheaths, and you carry nothing else other than what a person would carry when they travel. Now, again, to summarize, the main. Uh, points the main conditions of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Number one, as we said, both treaty, both parties agree to a conditional ten-year truce. A conditional meaning that if anyone violates, if anyone inflicts harm, if one party inflicts harm on the other, if a Muslim kills a pagan or a pagan kills a Muslim, the the, the treaty has been breached and the treaty is now null and void. Number two, any Meccans who flee to Medina 
must return to Mecca. So any Meccans, you know, like the son of Suhail, if Abu Jandal, for example, if he tries to flee to Medina, the Prophet and the Muslims will have to return him to Mecca. Any Medinans, any, any Muslim from Medina who flees to Mecca may remain in Mecca. They have to remain in Mecca. They're not to be sent back. Number four, there will be no tolerance for treachery or betrayal. If the conditions are violated, خلاص بعد. The treaty becomes null and void. Number five, each city is free to make pacts with third parties. Number six, the Muslim pilgrims will not perform the pilgrimage that year. They will perform it the following year. And of course, number seven, the Muslims may return the following year bearing no arms except the arms of a traveler. Next year, they can perform the pilgrimage. Now, as we mentioned, there was a lot of uproar. There was a lot of dissatisfaction in the ranks of the Sahaba. Many of them were dissatisfied. They were angry. They were livid. Umar ibn al-Khattab openly opposed the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, doubting the messenger, the, the prophethood of Rasulullah. Without much support, the Prophet ﷺ, of course the Prophet is consultative, but ultimately he makes the final decision, especially if this is a decision that is being commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So without much support, the Prophet, he ratified the treaty, which became known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And this was arguably one of the most unpopular decisions of the Prophet, but as we will discuss in our subsequent episodes, it proved to be the precursor for a great victory as stated by the Qur'an in Surah Al-Fat where Allah says, إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحًا مُبِينًا And inshallah, in our next episode, we'll speak a little bit more about how the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, why it was considered فَتْحًا uh, مُبِينًا as mentioned in the Quran. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in once again. And I look forward to having you join me in future episodes of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Uh, thank you for the lecture, Shaykh. Uh, so, so with this uh, treaty, I'm kind of curious about one of the uh, parts of it like does it allow well, well when i was talking about meccans who go to medina uh, medina like sorry muslims who go to uh, mecca is it talking about people who effectively abandon islam or is it assuming that like muslims would want to go to uh, mecca so it seems that um so 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 if someone were to reject islam it seems that that would be included because because it's not specified. So if someone were to leave Islam, they they can safely go back to Mecca and they don't need to go back to Medina. If a Muslim simply even goes to visit, goes to visit uh, in Mecca without any you know type of permission, then they would uh, they would be detained. So it seems that would would based on the fact that. It's absolute in its language. It seems that it would apply to both, both situations. Whether it's someone who had abandoned Islam or someone who simply wanted to go and visit relatives in Mecca. Yeah, I guess the one of the surprising parts about that part was it seems like it says that people from Medina who flee to Mecca, they may remain in Mecca, not that they have to be remain have to remain. And it almost seems like detaining them would be an act of violence towards them yeah i mean it's it's hard to tell exactly if uh if it's referring to i mean as i said because of the the generality of the uh the language that's being used uh if yeah so fleeing would uh denote that this is someone who's effectively uh abandoned islam um so obviously someone like that would be protected because we have to remember that to, to leave Islam is tantamount to treason against the Islamic State. So it seems that this is a sort of protection that's being granted 
to someone who, for whatever reason, would want to abandon Islam. But it also it also seems, you know, from the language that the Quraysh want to maintain control over Mecca and to allow Muslims to just freely visit whenever they want could potentially uh, create a lot of problems for the power brokers in, in Mecca because ultimately they don't want what they perceive as the negative influence of the Muslims on their own families. So I, I highly doubt that it's it's restricted to people who apostate, uh, but rather it would include apostates as well as any Muslim who's simply traveling to Mecca to, uh, for visitation. So it seems that the Meccans, the Quraysh, they want to control their population. They want to ensure that they want to protect their people. They want to protect their base from the negative influences of the Muslims. So if they just allow Muslims to just enter and exit freely, uh, they'll essentially continue to lose people. You know, and this is why you know Suhail uh, ibn Amr is you know very adamant about this because he doesn't he doesn't want his son to leave. He doesn't want to lose his family. Uh, he doesn't want to lose his son. So yeah, I think that. Uh, depending on how you translate, uh, from from my humble and my limited research, I, it seems that it applies to both people who apostate as well as just regular visitors for the reasons that I mentioned. And is this treaty effectively offering protection to Muslims in Mecca who have to stay in Mecca? I mean, yeah, it's... Uh, you know, because the the treaty says that they're not they're they're not gonna they're gonna hold their hands they're not gonna lay, they're not gonna lay their hands on each other, so that would imply that the Muslims who are in Mecca they're not to be tortured. Yes, they're not to be imprisoned or tortured. Okay, thanks. And um, when they were writing the uh, the treaty, when the Prophet kind of like scratched out his title and he wrote down his own name. Is this showing that the prophet was able to read and write? Because he's often called the unlettered prophet. Yeah. So that's a very good question. Now, the if you look at some of the narrations, especially the narrations that are found in Sunni sources, the prophet asks Ali, you know, point to me where it says Rasulullah, and I'll scratch it out. So in, in the Sunni references, you see that the Prophet has to ask Ali to put his finger on the, the title Rasulullah for him to cross out. Now, the, there are some Shia scholars who believe that the Prophet was, was not able to read and write. Now, it's a minority of scholars, from at least among the contemporary ones, but uh, our narrations uh, simply say that the Prophet was able to, to read and write. And just because he has... Ali, just because he's dictating to Ali, doesn't imply that he can't read or write. It was quite normal for people in positions of authority to, to have scribes. You know, there are many kings, many rulers, many emperors who when they want to draft a, uh, a treaty or a covenant, they dictate to others to write it for them. So this doesn't necessarily mean that the person is, uh, is illiterate. 